um, actually discovered I had synesthesia in perfume school because a lot of my um, smell uh, formulas and everything were really um, very influenced by sound. And actually the first thing I made in school other than lilac was the scent of old records. And so I came back to Montreal with the idea of, hey, perfume is so subjective. And at the time it was a pretty uh, new concept. Um, because perfume is so subjective and so hard to connect to, how can we find ways uh, for people, because music is such a universal language and doesn't require a language per se, and it can connect emotionally to so many people, how can we find a way to connect that and show perfumery through that lens because there are so many different things that need to be in harmony, it's time-based, it's emotion-based, they're both invisible, they just, they just had way too many connections, and I'm so happy to be here to to share these connections with you guys, because I'm sure that we're going to be able to have, we have so many perspectives and different perspectives on it. And yeah, my brand is called Jasmine Sarai. I'll write it down for you guys. So here I basically connect sense, sound, and um, culture. Uh, I, I hear songs, I represent them. I also lyrics, timbre, tempo, rhythm, all of these different things that go into creating a fragrance um, can also be compared to sound. Um. Hello everyone, this is Yosh. I'm the producer. Thank you so much for being here. It, it, it was really, it's still challenging for me to exactly chew gum and talk at the same time, sorry. Um, I wanted to just let everyone know that I'm recording this, but I, I just pressed play or record on the whole thing. So, so I'm sorry to make you do this, but Heather, can you reintroduce yourself? And Steven, can you reintroduce <laughs> yourself? And is it okay for me to, to type in the chat box now your, um, your matches, sorry, so should I just put it in the chat box now? Because I don't um, think you're like talk. Or have, oh, I was just saying, or do you want to just like, as we're going through our songs, we can put it in the message just so that it doesn't get buried with other chats or? Oh, sure. Okay. Or we can put it in now. All right. Um, uh, let, me put it in, let me put it in now because okay. then I can't chew gum at the same time. No and, problem. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about it, I'll, I'll write it again. Is that all right with everyone? Okay. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Uh, um, just looking at the first song. First song is by Stevie Wonder. Um, but I'll go with the introduction. Um, again, my name is Heather D'Angelo and I'm the founder of Carta Fragrances. And I'm also um, in the band of Voix Simone. Of Voix Simone started in 2003. Um, it was my main career for most of my life. I've traveled all over the world um, with my band and we've been featured on like countless TV uh, and uh, TV and movies. Uh, most recently, Twin Peaks, David Lynch's um, Twin Peaks The Return, which was super cool for us. And I discovered I've always loved perfume. I've always loved wearing perfume, which is a much different thing. I've always loved buying perfume and wearing perfume. Um, but it wasn't until around 2007 that I discovered that I wanted to make perfume. And I discovered that because a friend of mine, David from the brand DS and Durga, um, you might be familiar with that other indie brand. Um, he's also a musician and he was making a wedding fragrance for a friend of mine. And they invited me to his studio one day and just, it was the first time I had ever in my life seen a perfume studio. And when I saw the floor to ceiling shelves of just like, well, what a perfumer studio looks like, just shelves of bottles. And he had a big table that was just filled with like potions. And um, it just really just completely just piqued my interest. And I was like, one day, one day I'm going to teach myself perfume. But in New York City and with my touring schedule, that wasn't possible. So it wasn't until I moved to San Francisco about six years ago that I finally had the time and the space uh, since my band started taking more of a backseat in my life to start exploring perfumery. I'm a self-taught perfumer, much like a lot of people. And, um, and yeah, and I launched Carta about two years ago. So I'm, I'm new, I'm kind of like new to the industry here, but I really love perfuming. And for me, it's just another medium of my self-expression. I think of creating fragrance very much in the same way that I create music, which is that it just kind of comes through me. Um, and yeah, we could definitely talk more about that. I mean, composing fragrances and composing scents, they have a lot, I think, in common. And I will end my intro there. Steven. Hello, my name is Steven Guntarski. Um, 
I work with Lucky Scent, an online uh, retailer of uh, niche and independent perfumes, and I manage their store called Scent Bar. I've been doing that for the past 10 or 11 years. And um, I'm surrounded by perfume all the time. It's just what I do. I talk about perfume all day with uh, very passionate people who love perfume. Um, I guess the focus is much more on smaller independent and niche brands. That's what um, Lucky Scent specializes in. So I've always had a love affair with perfume, which is why I, I got into this work. Um, I don't make any perfume. I've dabbled a little bit in the past and have thought about it. But um, just in talking with perfumers and fans, there are just so many super fans of perfumes who just are so knowledgeable that um, over the years, I've just come to know a little bit about the basics of perfumery, of how things are actually made, what different materials smell like. And it's, it's endlessly fascinating to me. I love it. But um, like Heather, I work in... Um, other disciplines um, for in terms of creativity. I was a, a sculptor. I went to um, um, grad school for art and I did yeah. sculpture for 10 years before I moved to LA. And um, I don't do any visual art anymore, but in more recent years, I, I've turned to music, which was actually my first passion. As a little kid, I was actually forced to uh, do classical training. Um, I have a Korean mom and that's kind of what you do, uh, along with my sister who's a pianist. And so I, I did a classical training until I was 18. Um, and it's funny, when I, when I started college, I just thought music is done. I kind of closed it and I didn't think I would ever revisit it again, except always as a fan. I, I love to listen to music until now in my old age, I, I thought, why not? I, I love music and it's just a part of me. So um, I write and I record and play songs. And um, the name of my project is Hedion. And for perfume people, you know that that's an aroma chemical. Um, but it's a smell that I really love. Maybe that's why I was asked to be part of this um, talk, because um, um, just the name of my music is the name of a, of a smell. Um, I have something on SoundCloud. It's just called Hedion. So you can listen to, to the music that I, I make. And I'm really excited to be here. As I said in our pre-introduction, um, I found that working at Scent Bar, I get to know our customers so well, and I, I found that so many of them are musicians. It's not even a coincidence. I think that there's something there more than any other discipline. Like we have so many more musicians than we do actors or writers. And you think in LA, everyone would be an actor, but we have just nonstop musicians. And I've spoken to musicians. Like, why do you think that is? And um, this really great songwriter, Ilse, who is a regular at the store is like, well, I mean, it's not a coincidence. They're both chords, you know? They even have the same terminology. Like there's so much crossover between smell and music. And I, I do agree with that for sure. Um, um, Donna mentioned synesthesia and it's interesting. I've always had this fascination with synesthesia. In fact, I wrote my college thesis about synesthesia, but specifically it was about architecture and music and architecture being frozen music. So. So I've dabbled with the idea of synesthesia for a long time, but this is the first time I'm actually addressing it in, in terms of music and perfume. So I'm really excited to get started. Do I go next or do we just wanna kind of just dive into it? Yes, no. Uh, sorry, Dana. Um, yes, no, I got I got your intro uh, recorded. So that's perfect. Thank you so much. And I, I love that that we got into a little bit more of each of your backgrounds. Stephen, I had no idea that um, you were a sculptor. And Dana, I didn't even know that you also studied music. I, I just, of course, I should have known this. So yeah, <laughs> let's get started. Thank you so much. So I, I feel a little bit more calm. Everybody's in the room and I've put the playlist up there for everyone and then yeah so if if we want to just go for it let's do it jam yeah all right so does everyone have spotify up yeah okay and now i understand that not all of you may have these materials in fact most of you probably won't have these materials so we're going to do our best to describe them and i believe the first one up is power flower stevie wonder uh and that is dana um, so of this entire album, I feel like the entire album could be 
a fragrance album, if that makes any sense. Even just, and I'll bring you the cover, even cover is spectacular. Um, It has a very pistachio color, and it's off of his album, The Secret Life of Plants. I had a very hard time picking because there's actually quite a few songs here that you can definitely um, translate. Uh, but in this case, I decided to go with something a little bit more tropical. So a tiare absolute, which smells um, like Monoi. That's what most people would like to Tahitian Monoi. So very summery, very um, full of salicylates. So like almost like sunscreen uh, and smells really almost very citric and very floral, very rich and deep and complex. And then I decided to, um, so basically, cause I've done it a little different than you, Heather and, and you, Steven, in the sense is that I created like small baby accords when I heard the music. Cause whenever I hear music, I hear so many, or I smell so many different things and I have to break them down. Cause there's, Again, it's time-based, so it changes over time. So there's all of these different elements. So initially, when I heard the song, I heard Tiare because of the, the, the keys and just like the citric floral quality to it. And then Kentoxal is in the ozonic, fresh uh, family. It has a small anisic component to it, which is really nice, but it's, it's very um, aquatic. In, in a way. So it, so for me, when I mix that and that, it creates this color, if that makes any sense to anybody. And, um, and then I decided to finish it off with Triplau. And Triplau is a very um, green note. It's honestly quite, I can't find it because as you can see, my lab is quite messy in comparison to a lot of other perfumers. Um, but I, there's a method to my madness, as Kurt Cobain used to say, it's organized confusion. Um, in any case, Triplal is a very uh, wet, ivy, leafy material. So it's in the green leaves family. It adds this um, really interesting, lush uh, jungle kind of scent to it, but it really just enhances any greenness in any accord. And that's kind of what I created. So it was floral, uh, aquatic with a with obviously a lot of lush green notes and that's what I smelled when I heard power flower <laughs> I'm listening now and I can totally hear that like that's so awesome I I wish I could smell exactly the accord that you made but I can like because of your description I feel like I can smell it um and yeah like this is such that's this is smoothness to this song and a lushness I, I love that excited for your next ones I went with a big floral theme, um, obviously, as well. Um, I like themes. I like to play around with the idea of an EP. Um, so the next one is Perfume de Gardenias. This is the original by Rafael Hernandez, but there's quite a few um, variations. This one I went a little bit literal, uh, just because the song is so beautiful and really swoony and, uh, the gar gardenia, I don't have any gardenia absolute at the moment because it's so hard to get, right? And uh, I think Mandy, Mandy Aftel could have like five mils somewhere from Colombia, I believe. But really, it's such a difficult material. Um, I recreate it synthetically when I need to. Uh, but it's also quite opulent, right? It's much creamier than Tiare, uh, less citric to me. It's very buttery. Um, it's quite a diva. And, and I find her kind of melancholic in a way. And this song is very melancholic. He's talking about how the smell of her kiss and the smell of her mouth actually smells like gardenias. Uh, so I went with a gardenia absolute um, and a little bit of musanone. Musanone is a very light, modern musk to me. And I find that uh, it will add that aspect of mouth without making it smell bad, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, and then Helionol. Helionol is a very um, watermelony material, right? It also has a slight licorice note, but it's only like you really have to pay attention to it. So again, I played around with this kind of like gardenia full of love without it being sexualized too much, but really playing on the sensuality and the musky aspect of the, the big, thick, yummy petals alongside with a little bit of that aquatic uh, 
I don't know, je ne sais quoi, I guess. Um, as you can see, I'm really hardcore with this theme. But uh, yeah, that's really, that's really the essence of that song. And he also repeats it over and over again. So I think that's also important. I like to play around with that. Like I have one perfume called Nar and in Arabic music, uh, it's, it's constructed completely different than Western music um, in, the set, in the sense that we have quarter tones. And so I like to play around with either repetitions or things that are very staccato. So like, it's really interesting to play with, with how music is constructed and try to translate that into, into a smell. I love that I can hear like the lift that Helianol would give. I hear in like the, the piccolos or, or whatever that, um, you know, the, the bright flutes yes, are. Exactly. Um, and that there is this like very romantic quality to the song. And like, though you added a little bit of this muscanone, it's not like, as you mentioned, like a super sexualized kind of, like it's a very dreamy romantic feeling. Um, it's beautiful. Then next, we went. I went into a different um, vibe altogether. Jai Paul. This is one of his very, very um, popular songs, and I really like the fact that if you heard it on headphones or on very specific speakers, he has an element of going in and out of of left and right, left and right towards the end, especially. Um, and you can hear it later too, because you sometimes you won't notice it uh, on like upon first. Uh, first uh, hearing. Um, so I went with the Jasmine Absolute India because I really enjoy playing with that specific type of Jasmine. It's a lot sweeter than Egyptian Jasmine and it's a lot more affordable than French Jasmine. <laughs> and it's really quite well-rounded. It's uh, really um, approachable and what we consider Jasmine, really, really. Um, and then I played or I juxtaposed it with two other really um, more ambery metallic materials, one being Izu E Super, which a lot of us uh, love. And I also just love the, the name, the given name to Izu E Super, uh, just because I don't know, it, it makes it, it sounds like a band on its own, you know, Izu E Super and Hideon could, could collaborate. And um, it has this very nice woody, ambery quality, but to me also has a very metallic undertone. And then Karma Wood is really sharp like super, super, super sharp. And that to me smells like synths. And also like frankincense always smells like synths to me too. So it's like, like that sharp aspect to it with, with the woody, ambery, modern, digital note, I guess, if you want, juxtaposed with the natural jasmine that gives it that, um, that vibrancy and the life. So I love playing with juxtaposing notes. I love playing also with modern, because we know jasmine in such a classical way and we have so many beautiful jasmine perfumes out there um so i just thought it'd be kind of cool to just be like okay what if we just go sh and make it more metallic and more edgy that's cool i guess um i'll go next with my selections um as I mentioned, I'm not a perfume. Oh, um, I keep getting a sign that my internet is not that stable. I don't know why. So if it cuts out and I need to repeat, just let me know and then I'll repeat anything that anyone missed. But um, is everyone hearing me okay right now? A little, okay, all right, here we go. So what I wanted to do because um, I have a love affair with um, perfume and with music, and I have a lot of ideas of what the crossovers are, but I'm not gonna talk specifically about um, any aroma chemicals or notes. What I wanted to do is just make this comparison between um, chords, chords of music, and chords of um, notes that make us smell. I find that really interesting. And <clears throat> it's in the Luca Turin Guide to Perfume A to Z. I think when he's writing about Mitsuko, or he's talking about a classical Shipra structure. And um, as all perfume people know, a Shipra is a chord that's made up of um, oak moss at, at the base, cystus labdanum, and bergamot. So there's something about when you combine these three notes together, they become a Shipra. They don't smell like this plus this plus this. They smell like D, a Shipra. 
And um, that's so fascinating to me. And he's talking about how perfumers will start to play with the, the ratios. And suddenly you just add a little drop of this and then voila, you have a Shebra. But it wasn't a Shebra before then, you know what I mean? So it's this little bit of alchemy, this magic. And when the proportions are just right, you get a completely new smell. And what I loved was that making that point of the smallest droplet will change the chord entirely, give it a completely different structure and feel. And I feel that's very musical too. My background is more with music in terms of um, what I've studied in my life. So I understood it this way. And when Yosh asked if I would participate in this talk, the first song that came into my mind was this song called Dials by my all-time favorite band ever called the Cocteau Twins. And it's because I always had this idea that this song was more perfume than song. To me, it's just oral perfume. And I wanted to talk about why I think that way um, of this song. It's a really interesting thing. Um, it's not on any of the records. It was played, the first time I ever heard this song was when I saw them live for the first time. And um, they played it, it was pre-recorded when the band actually came onto the stage. So they were kind of setting up the mood of the whole show. And, and because it was never on a record, it was a new song to everyone, all the fans. And it's so beautiful and so simple. And yet it goes through all these weird modulations. And so suddenly it becomes very dark and then it goes back to a light place. So you just feel they're setting the stage and it was almost multi-sensory. I feel like if you filled the auditorium with incense, it would have given the same effect. Basically, it's putting you somewhere else. You're no longer in Boston or whatever. You are in this Cocteau Twins land. And they managed to do this by playing the song rather than using um, smell. And the reason why I think this song in particular is so perfume is because there's really no narrative. There's not much of a melody. There's not like a driving line that goes through it. All it is is just shades and textures and light. And that just changes really subtly through the song. And I feel that's so similar to perfume because perfume does everything through so much nuance and all the changes that it happens on the dry down on, on your skin are very soft and subtle, but can go very dramatic from somewhere happy and clean and bright to somewhere very sinister and dark and then back again. And I love that music does this, perfume can do this. So what I wanted to do is talk about the actual chords of this song. So I brought my little keyboard here and here it is. And I don't know if the volume is gonna be okay. Um, let me know. So basically this song starts off with just the, does that sound all right? Everyone can hear that okay? All right. All right, that's a C major chord. And the song begins with a really pretty little ditty. It's nothing, it's just a C major scale. It goes, that's just a C major scale. Okay, so the whole song starts off with a C major scale. It's a tonic, it's um, very stable, it's a happy, it's uncomplicated. Nothing's gonna happen with a C major scale. But what is interesting is after that little first melody thing, this chord happens. Oh, it says my internet was unstable, so I'm gonna repeat that. This is the next thing that happens. So this is a C major nine. So this is a C major, but that one note is different. It's a D instead of an, uh, a C. And that D just hovers. So it makes it kind of otherworldly and extra beautiful and even a little bit sad. So this melody starts coming through. Back to the tonic C major. Here's a C sus4. So we feel something's gonna happen. And then this happens. That's C minor. And that comes out of nowhere. We came from a very happy C major into a very dreamy C9. And now we're and when that happened, when the song came on and, and we got to that C minor, it's like the temperature just dropped. Like 
the, the sun was blocked by dark clouds. And what is so interesting is the difference between C major and C minor is ha literally half a step. It's E flat rather than E. So that's why I wanted to talk about this song because just a half a step completely changes it from sunshine to dark clouds coming through. And then this happens to keep us in a dark place. And then, then we're getting into somewhere sunnier and happy. And then the song ends with back to the C major, but we have this D sustained the whole time. So what is so weird about this song is everything is sustained. The chords literally just go and go and go and they just sustain, there's no decay, which is why I chose this particular sound because it just holds. It's like perfume, it's just there and it wafts. So in a nutshell, basically the song is all about C major. It goes back to C major eventually. Like only one note difference between those two chords. C minor. So in ter terms of the chord progressions, that's what the song is. And I find it so interesting that the very smallest difference can do something so massive and huge and beautiful. So that's always something that inspires me. So when um, I write music, I try to just do little changes in the chord progressions and do, I mean, the, some of those chords are kind of um, out there. Like that's not a typical chord progression for a pop song. You'll, you'll find that more in classical music or, or jazz. And I love that. I think it's interesting to kind of experiment with chords that don't sound quite right or pretty or a progression that is kind of unexpected because you can get a lot of drama and a lot of um, texture and light through that. So I did want to talk about a specific smell example to go along with that song, Dials. And so I grabbed this. Um, this is called Le Cri de la Lumière. And this is a perfume from a brand called Parfum d'Empire. And I've always loved this. I'm a big fan. And I just kind of put two and two together as well when I realized that the name means, um, originally it was called Le Cri de la Lumière, the cry of light. So I thought that was interesting that it's already a nod to synesthesia, that light can have a sound, like a cry. But very interesting. And then, in fact, it's the name of a smell. So it's all the senses being combined. And this fragrance is, the main components of it are um, iris, rose, and ombrette. And for some reason, in their copy, they don't mention patchouli, but there's obviously definitely a patchouli in there because it smells like a sheep or when you wear it. And What's interesting about this scent is like that song, it modulates between light and dark. It has this really happy, pretty ombre, which is almost like a pear-like smell. And that goes with that rose and makes it very pretty and sunny. But then in the dry down, it suddenly goes through this phase where um, the patchouli comes through and it becomes quite dark and thick. And then it kind of goes back into the iris and rose and ombre. So it's a really interesting fragrance that I feel just plays with transparency, but constantly changes. And it's a Shepra. And like I said in the beginning of this description, it's reading that description of Shepras and how you have to be so precise with the proportions to make this new note, which is a Shepra. So, that's that. That's um, the first song. And I'm not going to be this long-winded with everything, but the first song really speaks to me as an example of um, um, sonic perfume, which is why I spent a lot of time with it. So the second piece of music that I wanted to talk about is called um, Night Scented Stock, and it's by Kate Bush. It's from this record here called Never Forever. And What's interesting is this song came out in um, 1980. 
And in 1976, four years before it, um, the British perfume house Penhaligon's came out with a fragrance called Night Scented Stock. I don't know if this song is inspired or is named after that perfume. I, I don't know. And I tried to research it, but um, Kate Bush is actually very private, does very few interviews. So no one has been able to say anything about that. But maybe it was just in the air. It was a perfume that people were wearing at the time when she was writing the song. But whatever the case may be, when Penhaligon's did that in 1976, I felt it was a moment of that English romanticism that was kind of popular in, in culture at the time. There's just this idea of like taking a walk at night and smelling these flowers that only emit scent at night. It's very romantic and beautiful. And the perfume itself is kind of an oriental. It has a lot of spice and carnation and um, ambers. And the piece of music that has the same name is really interesting. It's so short. I think it's only like one minute or something. It's less than two minutes for sure. And it's between two other songs. It's just supposed to be this little like breath of perfume between two songs. And it's just her voice. It's just layered. And it's just like a melody like, And if you were to imagine an uh, English story, very romantic of walking at night, you would hear something like that and you would smell the smell. So I feel that they're so perfectly linked. And the fact it's just her voice layered. I think she used uh, a Fairlight synthesizer and sampled her voice and just played her voice like a little aria, which is beautiful. And when I was reading about this song, one person referred to it as a nocturne, which is a song about night. And I think that's perfect. Just as Night Scented Stock is like a, a, a perfume nocturne. It's about this nighttime um, scent experience, which I think is really beautiful. And then the third piece that I want to talk about was the Chopin Piano Concerto. And <clears throat> I specifically chose this piece because I wanted to talk about um, timbre and what that is. Timbre is the qualities of the voice. So you can describe, let's say you're hearing a trumpet, you might say that it's bright and brassy, um, or a sound might be hollow, um, um, shrill. These are all ways of describing timbre. You're describing the quality of, of the sound. And I feel that we use similar words when we talk about smells and we talk about what is happening when we're smelling these things, like um, the different attributes of that smell. And the reason why I thought of the Chopin piece is because I have a personal um, history with it, because my sister was this amazing child prodigy pianist when I was growing up. And she um, played this piece with an orchestra. And I was just the younger brother, and I was um, a big geek in many ways. So I had the actual orchestral score, and I'd read it while she was playing it. And I would go over it um, listening to the record because I love to know what instruments were playing at different moments and what they were playing. That, that was just endlessly interesting to me. And I found that what Chopin did often was he used the sound of a flute with the sound of a reedy um, woodwind instrument like a clarinet or an oboe. Something about this pairing of that hollow flute with that reedy woodwind would create this particular sound. Oh, unstable connection, one sec. Anyway, so com combining these two sounds of a flute and an oboe or a clarinet does this beautiful thing, which to me I describe as sort of like the air in the morning or the air in the evening. And maybe that's why I chose hedion as um, sort of my symbolic smell when I make music, because I describe hedion as being that, like the smell of the air in the morning. And I feel that the clarinet and um, flute have that same effect, but with, with, with sound. But having said all this, it's funny because I re-listened to the second movement um, again and again, and I don't really hear any examples of what I'm talking about, of the flute and clarinet. I thought it was there. I was, I was really sure of it, but it's not really. But it's a beautiful piece anyway, and it's a really gorgeous piece um, to talk about timbre in, um, in context. Because, for example, when the piano starts playing, the pianist is playing so gently, so the, the timbre of the piano is so different than if you start playing like a fortissimo. You're just gently 
gently um, pressing the keys. And it has this beautiful sound. I feel it's almost like the sound of moonlight on, on, on rippling water, you know? And you definitely get that feeling when you're um, listening to this. And then when I was researching this piece, Chopin actually wrote about this movement and he called it a reverie. He says, it's a kind of reverie in the moonlight on a beautiful spring evening. I mean, that's perfect, I love it. And it's, it goes right hand in hand with the previous piece, The Night Scented Stock. So when you think this piece is about moonlight and the perfect spring evening, you can imagine the smells as well. I feel it's a very synesthetic piece and I love that. And the final point that I wanted to make about Chopin and that piece is I wanted to give it a very specific um, perfume context too. So I wanted to just um, talk about Guerlain for a second because Chopin wrote that piece in around, I think it was um, 1820 or so. And Guerlain started in 1823 or something. So, I mean, they're at the same time. Like Chopin was alive when Guerlain opened their, their perfume house in Paris. And I feel that some of the Guerlain masterpieces have that feeling where they're, they're using the timbre of these notes, like real oak moss and, and uh, high quality iris, things that maybe you can't achieve so much now because there's so much natural in some of their masterpieces and, and we don't really work in that way anymore, uh, perfume wise. But I feel that there is a nice sympathy between Guerlain and Chopin and it's that romanticism and that Frenchness. And I feel that it's not a coincidence that a lot of the masterpieces from Guerlain, like Mitsuko, came in these beautiful wooden boxes um, that were lacquered and looked almost like violins or fine instruments. So I feel that um, it's not too outlandish to say that there is some kind of a link maybe between Chopin and the, and the romantic composers and a classical perfume house like Guerlain. So, that's it. That was kind of long-winded and I didn't really talk specifically about notes, but I just wanted to talk about general feel and how they might go together. So um, thanks. And um, Heather, I'm dying to know about your selections. Wow. That's a really hard to follow up, Stephen. <laughs> um, that was amazing. I could listen to you talk about this stuff all day. Um, I'm going to preface my my uh, my talk on just saying that I stand by Frank Zappa's quote that uh, writing about music is like talking about architecture. I think that um, talking about music is similar. I've always struggled to talk about my own music um, and then also talk about my perfume, but but here we go. Um, I will say that my band of Wasimone, we started out with this like deep love of analog synthesizers, vintage analog synthesizers. So um, I've always been drawn to electronic landscapes. And it's funny as a perfumer, as much as I totally love natural ingredients, um, I think that I've always also been drawn to aroma chemicals, synthetics, because you can construct an electronic landscape in a way using synthetics as well. There's always something that's kind of like a little bit off about them, like they're faking it, they're faking nature, which I love. Um, so what I've selected today are three uh, synthetics or aroma chemicals, whatever you want to call them, that I got from Perfumer's Apprentice. Shout out to Travis on the call. Love Perfumer's Apprentice, keeping all of us indie perfumers uh, in creative, in, in our helping us facilitate our cre creativity. Um, and I've also selected three very heavy synth, uh, synth pieces for us to listen to, some of my favorites. So if you want to go to the first one, it's Le Chasse aux Microbes uh, by Michael Bunt, who is a German krautrock musician. So I'm just going to put that on so I can talk about it. All right. And so a little bit about my background. So I studied tropical uh, tropical ecology and a big part of my job is going into the rainforest and collecting soil cores from the ground and extracting um, basically you collect the soil core you bring it into a lab and then you process the soil and you do DNA extraction on it which helps you to look at the different populations of fungi and bacteria in the soil. So you're taking this natural ingredient and through chemicals you're transforming it to data um, and that's my first like love for this song is that uh, I don't know much about why Michael Bont wrote it, but it obviously had something to do with like microbes and which is, you know, very near and dear to my heart. But so I think of it as this kind of like synthetic landscape of microbial communities. And 
if that makes any fucking sense. And so the, the, the ingredient that I've chosen that goes along with this to me is actually ISOE Super, which Donna already spoke about. And for me, the reason that I love um, ISOE Super is that it has this very like calm, comforting, linear quality to me, but it's also very full and um, kind of like soft background music. And that's what this song feels like to me. It also kind of just feels like a really good like CBD high. Like it's, it's like staring at the wall, kind of like, uh, like that's the song. You can just listen to it go on and on. And that's how ISO E feels to me. It's just like, I'm the smell. It's like, just like, yeah. <laughs> it's just got this like linear, feel good comfort. Like I'm gonna stare at the wall for five hours smell. Um, so I don't really have much to say about ISO E besides that. Um, I love working with it. Um, I think a lot of us perfumers, we put ISO E in a lot of stuff. Um, if right, <laughs> CBD high, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Yush. Um, and yeah, this song to me just has this wonderful kind of expansive landscape that's just very chill. Um, we can listen to more of that on our own time. I can, I can be moving it on from here. Okay, the next one, it's a real theme here. Also, soil festivities. So we're going to move on to this one. This is Soil Festivities Movement 2. Again, I tend to really like synthetic songs about soil and microbes. Um, and this one is by Vangelis. And now Vangelis did the soundtrack of Blade Runner. Um, it's one of the things he's most known for. And this song to me, if you have it on right now, it has this like, so what it reminds me of, well, first I'll go into the, to the smell. So I chose floral ozone, which I've never known if I'm pronouncing correctly, floral ozone. Thanks, Dana. <laughs> yeah. Um, and floral ozone has this like powerful, clean, green, fresh, uplifting kind of quality to it. Um, it's supposed to smell like fresh air, but again, it's kind of like this fake out. Like it's, it's beautiful, but almost in, small, so in strong doses, it also has this like kind of plastic quality. So um, what I love about this song and the composer Vangelis is that, and the whole Blade Runner thing is that Floral Ozone to me is also the character of Rachel from Blade Runner. Like this is a beautiful replicant. Um, and that's what the song feels like to me. It's, um, you've got those like high kind of creeping notes, but it's very gentle. It's also kind of linear, much like the last song. It's electronic music, so it doesn't like really ever, it, it expands it very gently. It's not gonna like, you know, go anywhere dramatic. Um, so yeah, that's how I feel about floral ozone. Okay, and then, I feel like this is gonna be really short. <laughs> and then the last one um, is, you wanna move, so <laughs> brace yourself. I picked um, a song called Config Sis by um, a chiptune heavy metal artist that I'm obsessed with called Master Boot Record. And um, to me, this is the song of Oud 10760. If any of you know this, it's kind of like a monstrous material. Um, it's a synthetic reconstitution of aloes wood. Um, and it has all of that kind of complexity um, and it has all the sour notes of the natural. So there's something like almost abrasive to it, much like this song. Um, but it's also like deeply complex and beautiful in some moments. You just have to like wait for it. If you can like get through the hard parts of this song where it's just like, I mean, you might be listening to it now and it's like really driving. If you wait for it, there are moments where this like arpeggio synthesizer comes in that just like lifts up the whole song and it really takes you on this crazy journey. And that's how I feel about Oud 10760 as well. Like it starts off kind of sour and you're like, Ugh. and then as the dry down happens, it just takes you to this incredibly like beautiful, complex, monstrous place. So uh, it's, a, it's a good one in my arsenal as well with creating perfume. And that's all I've got for you. Um, I hope you enjoy my playlist and, you know, my songs and like listen to them in, in their fullness sometime. 
So, sorry, we've got a question, Heather, um, the mm -hmm. name material that you just uh, mentioned. Oh, oots or headbangers. <laughs> um, the, I, I could put all the ingredients. So the first one that we did was ISO E Super, and I'm putting that one in here. The next one was floral ozone. That was the Rachel from Blade Runner. And this beast right now is the Oud 10760. There you go. Wow, okay, that, that was truly amazing, all of you. Um, it, it's 11 now, but I, I feel there must be some questions from the audience, if you don't mind staying on for a little may, bit. May I ask a question to Heather and Donna? Yeah. Uh, I love this. I don't know um, some of these uh, aroma chemicals. Now, when you're practicing, have you come up with any combinations that were completely unexpected and did something that you never dreamt would have happened, considering how they smell individually as opposed to mm. combined? That's a good question. I have a lot of things that haven't seen the light of day. Mm. Yeah. I haven't made them public, but like, I accidentally recreated like, like to me, what a Wawa pedal would smell like, you know? And I was working on a Jimi Hendrix that I also never saw the light of day. I either recreated, I accidentally created Coca-Cola, like the scent of Coca-Cola and, <laughs> and then the Wawa pedal. And I thought, wow, okay, maybe I could do something with this. Who knows? Wow. But yeah, never out there. Um, but when it comes, I mean, I'm pretty proud and happy to, my whole brand is, all of the perfumes are either like olfactory reinterpretations of songs. So I've been lucky enough to be able to bring those out in into the world. Like for me, my neon graffiti, initially I was like, what is MIA sun shower smell like? And it was very, very neon to me. And what does neon smell like? And obviously it's a very subjective reinterpretation, but those are all accidental, but maybe also on purpose. If that answers your question, I'm not even yeah. sure if it is. Are there any um, materials? That, I mean, when you smell isoly super on its own or any like large molecule aroma chemical, they're hard to smell. But you know that when it's used in the composition, it will do something. It'll mm -hmm. hold everything together or it will, um, or I, I, I was talking to um, a perfumer that I know and I was talking about my love affair with Hedion. And he's like, oh, yeah, for sure. It's kind of a known thing. And when you make perfume, just keep adding helium until it's yeah. good, you know? Have you found there are other materials that don't do so much on their own, but you need them there just to kind of soften edges and to kind of keep the composition going? Hmm. Um, all flowers, actually, which makes it super, in well, most flowers, like let's take the jasmine, indole right? And it's almost like a metaphor for life, but it's also exactly what you were talking about before, where it's like small, a little thing can go a long way and change everything, right? So indole, even though it's extremely strong on its own, if you take it and dilute it to 0.001% and add it into a floral accord, what it will do is it's going to boost that entire thing. And even in its natural, in all of their natural constituents, most flowers have this like very, very small, minute, a dose of ugliness and like the smell yeah. of death, right? And like mothballs and really something quite putrid, but it actually is what makes it so much more beautiful. And I think that was one of the biggest revelations for me in perfumery that one little tiny drop of something diluted almost always will create an entirely different kind of shift. Almost like if you were like, it's a Petri dish and you drop it and everything changes, right? It's exactly that, and it plays on the, the metaphor of harmony, too. Like, just how everything needs to be layered, everything needs to be cut up. Like, think of, I always think of a Pro Tools, or like, let's say Garage Band, because that's more approachable to a lot of us, right? And we're breaking down the, the drums and the, the bass and the guitar and the vocals, and you know that some, certain things need to be normalized, and so it's the same thing. And so in naturals, it happens naturally and then in perfumery you can add any dose of anything ugly and it will boost and enhance the beauty of something that's funny that reminds me of with music adding a rubbing note like which is something that you know we would always do in our band is just add like one kind of high note that kind of rubs like really could make the overall piece more beautiful I always thought too about white noise. Like, what oh, if yeah. it's something that you 
was there, but you don't notice it's there, but it's there on purpose, but it's, it's, you know, that's, that's always something I thought of, like, what would be the scent of white noise? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, yeah, white noise is something that we would always play with in, in our band all the time, um, as well as doing all kinds of other, like, tricky, like, little audio things that you wouldn't be able to hear, but you feel. Um, the sound of, I mean, the smell of white noise. I mean, to me, that's almost like musk. Like any kind of musk might be white noise because like it, it's supposed to be more of a feel, well, not like, we all have musk fragrances, I'm sure that we love. My favorite is of course like Kubla Khan by Serge Luten, which is this just like monster musk. Um, but musk usually in perfumes is like a little bit more of, um, yeah, or yeah, as, uh, as Danielle said, like a white musk, like it's supposed to be more like a skin scent. Or something with like a, a, a certain vi a strong vibration, mm. a vibrational effect. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what that would be. Um, any, I guess, of the Isobe Supers, Timber Silks. Uh, trying to think of the other one. Um, I find that Yonones, uh, anything that's iris. Oh, yes. They come and go, come and go, come and go. And that to me is super fascinating that you can smell something and then not smell it and then smell it again. And uh, that's actually what's so amazing about fragrance that's too. That's probably the key to this thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's that weird iris that just keeps going yeah. and morphs and changes. It's, it's fascinating. I'm also a big fan of methylatone. Like sometimes like the latones or the, the lactones can kind of do that, depending. But um, giving you more of that feeling of something. And a smell. I believe that's what you said before about um, a harsh note. Um, Who is that? We, we can't we, hear you. Lee, we can't hear you. Oh. Lee, Lee, we can't hear you. You have to turn up your volume, please. Uh, you can also oh my gosh. you can also type in your question, Lee, because because we don't have sound, and I see that you're unmuted. Um, yeah, Catherine, that link is so cool. I can't wait to read that later. That's awesome. Oh wow, that is interesting. White noise. That sounds like a good name for perfume for sure. Yeah. Olfactory white. <laughs> That's super cool. Does anyone else have questions? My, my mind is blown right now. I have to like, I want to listen to the playlist one more time, given all this information that we got. Oh, all right. No questions? Wow, okay. This has been super, really. Thank you so much, Dana and Heather and Steven. This has really been so sensational. I feel like I have to digest a lot of things. Um, okay, and so, yes. So I did record it and um, I, I haven't figured out where to post it and how I wanna post it. Um, so as soon as I do, I'll send an email out. Um, and, and so, so it, it has been recorded. I just don't know where I'm going to post it. So thank you so much. And then um, if you want the uh, playlist and the matches, again, I, I've posted on the chat. I've saved the chat. And I will post the chat um, on the Facebook page. And the Facebook page also has all the schedule for the whole um, festival. There have been many, many um, sessions added. The next ones coming up um, on Tuesday are, um, we actually have like a lot of um, new Insta lives that have been posted. Sorry, my brain, I can't process, but, and also type and chew gum at the same time. So go to the Facebook link, which I will post right now. And then we have um, like Scent and Mescal with Kelly Jones. We've got um, Crayon from um, Christine and uh, Niklas, who were the founders of Agonist. They have a new um, brand called Crayon. They're going to come up on Tuesday. And we also have um, another musician, actually. He's actually a, 
a reviewer um, called Stace Fresh Productions. And then next Thursday, we have um, Scent and Design um, coming up. Awesome. <laughs> uh, we also have, yeah, amazing. We have like Scent and Manufacturing. We have Indie to Industry. We've got Life Hacks coming up. We've got Scent and Future. Um, and then we also have um, Conversations, Fireside Chats with Libertine and American Perfumer. We've also got um, We Wear Perfumes um, from coming in from the UK. So. I can't remember everything that's coming up, but so look on the calendar. Um, let me post that now. If you have any closing remarks while I queue that up for everyone, that would be great. Just gives me a minute to like find what I need to find. So say, Danielle, I love your background. Is that one of your paintings? Oh, can we unmute her? Ah, uh, you're muted. Can we unmute Danielle? Oh yes, let me try. Where is she? Unmute. All right. So that's that's wild child behind me at least half of her oh so, it's beautiful they're botanical portraits so um huh. the thing that looks like a ball sack is the nose and then <laughs> the flowers on either side are the eyes what's kind of cut off is the big hair and you can see um the mouth below so i love it thank you I got tired of showing my living room, so yeah, mm -hmm. I switch it up a bit. Well, that's great. You know what I'd love to know if anyone has examples of this. Um, I've talked, I've spoken with different um, customers through the years who are involved in music, and we talked about actual performances that used scent, which um, is so interesting to me. I love that. Like. Um, I know an amazing set designer who has worked with Prince since forever. And he told me that when they did uh, the Purple Rain tour, that for some of the first dates, I think the tour started in Detroit, and they said they had these like huge barrels of carnations up in the rafters of the auditorium. What? Yeah, yeah. And during um, um, Purple Rain, they released all the carnations into the audience. Wow. He did this, I think, for three concerts. And he said it was amazing because no one expected um, how fragrant it was going to be when you <laughs> have this many carnations. It just, I mean, it influenced the whole concert, obviously, because you're smelling this like clovey carnation the whole time. And then they get flung out into the audience. I think that's so cool. And then we have another, um, a whole band that comes to um, Scent Bar, and you know who they are, but maybe I shouldn't say. But um, they, burn incense on stage and they um, actually asked about um, advice about different kinds of incense and what would last and fill up a space so I love that and when I was a kid everyone smoked clove cigarettes when you went to yeah. uh, concerts so for me that smell reminds me of like outdoor concerts in the summer of like indie music so I feel that there are all these great little theatrical scent music moments and I love to hear about them when people give me great examples. Oh my god, you know, the smell of performing for me will always be old beer. Just like old, like that is what is just every venue I've ever gone to smells like old beer and it's just so awful. So like I wish that we had been, I don't know, I wish that that had been on our mind. Like maybe we should burn some incense in here, <laughs> like do something. Um, yeah, and then of course before the smoking ban it was cigarettes. Cigarettes and old beer. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've actually been, uh, I love working with musicians. Before all of this went down, um, I've been collaborating with musicians for the last six, seven years on creating scented merch instead of selling like socks or t-shirts, right? Um, you could sell like the scent that is diffused through the, the performance. So I've collaborated with people where we've created like different scents for every song and it's a different wow. application. So it's either like people grab cotton that's embedded with the scent and they can take it home and scan the QR code straight to the song or, um, and then that way they get to keep it and also remember the, the performance in, in a much more visceral way. Or uh, there's also this guy, Lunas, who also plays around with incense before. He's an electronic DJ and he plays all kinds of things while um, incensing the stage. So I really, really actually want to do that more because I think there's, um, it's such an interesting experience. It enhances both senses at the same time. And I feel like there's a lot of room for experimentation there. And I love, love, love doing that with musicians especially here in Montreal, because we have a lot of, um, we have a really strong 
uh, community. And it's uh, really um, promising, I would say, more than anything. Yeah, I want to add to that, Stephen. Um, I've done a couple of um, events with Scent and Music. Uh, the I guess the biggest production I did was in Buenos Aires in 2017. We did a record release party for Dat Garcia. I put her link down with ZZK Records. They're in this like electronic dance music, but tribal folktronics. That's kind of the music that it's called, folktronics, because it's very tribal, but it's overlaid with, you know, electronic music. So it's very futuristic. And um, the ZZK Records also produces Equalas Cruz, if you're into that kind of music. But for the record release party, we actually um, rented out an old Victorian um, theater in Buenos Aires, um, and we, changed the seating so that we made the seating into two circular concentric circles and she was in the middle of the concentric circle and then we queued up uh, the choreography with a contemporary dancers and also the the lighting technology people and so every song had a, a, a custom scent that i designed to go with the wow. lights and then the dancers on cue every time the new song came on the dancers had props where they were dancing you know um around the theater and so even though we were in an old victorian theater it was very contemporary and very modern so that was fucking epic like that was awesome and then i worked with um uh, a cocktail chef down in buenos aires they have a very very um dynamic and lively night scene where you know they don't eat dinner until nine o'clock and then you know pre-game starts at 11 or midnight and then so the best bands don't come on until three in the morning and so the club scene is very dynamic and vibrant and so is the cocktail scene so i worked with someone down there to make a custom cocktail and because it was a little bit not it was like utopic apocalyptic and futuristic because again the tribal music with this very modern um overlay we i made the shots um kind of frozen in um syringes where you had to take the shot and then go into the theater to listen to the music so that was like over the top and then um and that that performance was called synesthesia um the whole thing so that was amazing and then um I can't remember what else I was going to mention about music, but um, anyways, I forgot what I was going to say. The, the, so I, I did something else, but now I can't remember. But wow, this was so amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. This was super fun. It's not very often that we get to talk about, you know, these kind of things together. It's usually one or the other. Oh, right. So the question from Kelsey. So the how was the scent diffused in the theater? Um, we scented the props and then the dancers with the props, like, you know, they had beautiful fans. They also had, we also scented some bubbles. Um, so the dancers um, had masks on their heads. So sort of like headdresses and those were scented. And so when the dancers were moving through the, the theater, you got different wafts of, of the scent. And, and then of course we had people um, who were wearing, the dancers were also wearing fragrance themselves. So when they were dancing throughout the stages, people could, you know, um, smell different things. And then we had someone at the top of the theater on the balcony also diffusing um, petals down. So that was really incredible. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, oh, and then the other thing I mentioned, I also put the link there, but Scent Events, um, who I partnered with on the Art of Bloom, they do amazing things with, um, productions as well. So Neil Harris uh, with Scent Events, he's done Khalid's tour this last summer where he scented every single show and he's done stuff for Katy Perry. He's done stuff for J-Lo. Oh. So they, do, they come up with the scent for the concert and then they pump it into the concert arena. So um, yeah, exactly. So um, they're, they're scent speakers, basically. And wow. so, so it's pretty amazing. So um, if you're interested in that, I can um, um, tell you more about it. But yeah, scent events with Neil Harris. And, you know, uh, so the, the thing that I did in LA, it wasn't musically um, performed per se, but it was scented into the theater space. Um, yeah, so in the HVAC, you can do, you can do, um, you know, diffusers, fans, um, 
Yeah, and the flowers were so, exactly so good question. The flowers for the Art of Bloom were in a big petal machine and 22,000 petals fell gently down as the scents were, you know, diffused in the theater. And that, that was, you know, one of my most beautiful <laughs> projects. Um, and that actually, I don't mean to make it about me, but that I'm so proud of it. It just um, won the Frame Awards. It also has been shortlisted for the ADC Awards. So I think what I love about this conversation and this festival is that it just allows us to talk about scent not in a perfume, not in a bottle, but to explore all our senses, including our intuition, our sixth sense. And I think hearing the three of you speak, uh, we all, you also mentioned David from Diaz Durga. There are also other perfumers who are musicians. And it's not that we're all synesthetic, which we are, I think, a little bit, but it's because we're multidimensional beings. And I think when you understand the vibrations of how we exist as humans as spirit beings, then the different vibrations, the different dimensions, and when you are integrated in that way holistically, then you can actually cross the different dimensions and coexist, right? So the music vibration, the, the, the sound vibration, the, the visual, we've got some designers here, um, Sid, um, Catherine, and um, Danielle are, are up next for the scent and design. And that's a whole other level of communication that's nonverbal um, that we can play around with in scent. So I'm just so thrilled about this session. I'm, I'm pumped. I'm like, I've got so much adrenaline. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, any other questions before we say our goodbyes? I want to mention, again, we've got other um, events coming up, but, but I want to have a, a, a like a, BYOB Zoom brunch, uh, like post party. So that's going to happen on the last Sunday of um, May. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so we've got from Lee, there's a theory that scent sensors and the nose are activated by vibration. Exactly. Vibration, it's all about the vibes. Thanks for the good vibes, everyone. If there's no <laughs> further questions or comments, thank you so much for your time. This event has been recorded and I'll figure out where we're going to. Um, Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. Okay. Ciao, ciao, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, it was amazing.